Welcome to the webinar portion of Mastering the Basics. This is going to be a crash course in your Court Reserve setup. So the setup of Court Reserve, I typically teach in three sets of three as far as the core setup goes. So tier number one we're going to address today is going to be the critical portions of your setup, the things that you should do as soon as possible if they apply to you, because it's going to save you time in the long run. And they just tend to be the most important aspects of the system anyway. So we're going to have three pieces of critical setup. The second tier is going to be things that are specifically related to bookings. It's called court reserve, right? So the bookings are a big part of it. So we'll address the three main types of bookings in court reserve in those settings. And then the last thing, which we'll touch on briefly during the webinar, but we typically cover a lot more in our knowledge base, our live chat, and our one-on-one -on -one calls that you can take subsequent to a Mastering the Basics webinar. The third tier is going to be website-related stuff and the three pages uh, with regards to websites that I say, hey, if you just want to get a good launching point for your court reserve portal and the aesthetics and the user interface, UI, UX, that kind of stuff. Um, here's the three things to start with. So 333 three, three is the outline for today. Let's get started. The first thing I would look at for any club that is going to be taking payments online is your integrated payment provider. So court reserve is able to host you taking payments online through court reserve. Court Reserve itself is not a payment provider. So one of the first things you should be thinking about if you're planning on taking online payments is who your payment provider is going to be. Um, we're happy to send you any of the details as far as like what the rates are, how to sign up, all of those things with the payment providers subsequent to this call if you just let us know in the chat. The big picture for setting up your payments is choosing a payment provider, setting up a merchant account with them, and then at the end of that process, whatever provider you go with, they're going to give you an API key that you'll just copy and paste back in Court Reserve. So let's say you go with Safe Save, you'll copy and paste an API key in here, and then you'll hit Save. At that point, you're ready to take online payments through Court Reserve. So the Court Reserve side of the payment integration is pretty simple. It's mainly just the decision and getting that process started that I would do as soon as possible. There's a couple of settings in the system that will only appear once I've got a payment provider in there. So the sooner I can get that in there, uh, the easier it's going to be for me to just make sure I've got all of my ducks in a row. The boxes are checked off. The boxes that you would be looking at, I'll show you as we go through the rest of the setup. Uh, but they're going to be things like requiring a payment profile for someone signing up for a membership or requiring upfront payment for courts, things like that. The quick note here. Enable convenience fees is also an option. So if you want to pass along any of the credit card fees to the customers that are using the credit cards online, you have the option to do that or not do that. And you can set uh, what that convenience fee is going to be. Happy to address that in more detail during the Q&A as well, because I know sometimes there's questions around that. So payments, critical setup piece number one. Critical setup piece number two is going to be memberships. So memberships in Court Reserve, regardless of whether or not you are actually a membership-driven club or organization, the memberships are still really important for every single person using Court Reserve. The reason is that I, everyone in your system should have a membership type because the membership type is what determines what can this person see, what are they allowed to register or not register for, and how much is it going to cost them. So even if everyone at your club is just going to be the same, they're all just a player, let's say, and you don't charge for memberships, you still need at least one membership type in there just to say, hey, this is the player membership type, and these are the rules for someone who's a player. So a lot of times clubs will have more than one membership type, but you should always have at least one. You'll see in this setup here that I've got a non-member membership type. This is very common. So this is how I say this person who has an account with me, uh, here's going to be the rules for them. They do not have a membership fee, but it's still considered a membership by that because uh, membership is the catch all for the rules of player access and player booking. So have a membership type for every type of person that is going to be using the system. Anyone who has a different set of rules that they're playing by or gets a discount on cost for certain things, anything like that, 
go ahead and make that a different membership type when you're setting up your memberships. Two other notes on memberships because they're really, really important. Um, these are the two biggest things that I see people either get confused on or just need additional clarity. Um, number one, family versus individual memberships. Family memberships are only necessary if you're offering a financial discount to people for purchasing a family membership versus an individual membership. It's specifically a financial consideration. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I don't have any family memberships, I just set only individual memberships up. I'm still able to use a lot of family functionality inside of Court Reserve. So just with individual membership types, I could still join a family account. I could still have primaries and children on that account. I could still manage the account, like signing my kids up for things. Uh, we can share a payment profile. So a lot of the family functionality you would expect isn't necessarily tied to having a family membership type assigned. The family membership type is just there to say, hey, if our individual memberships are 50 bucks a month, we're going to offer a couple membership for $75 a month rather than both of you having to pay 50. If that's your setup, that's the use case for family memberships. Other than that, if you don't have anything like that at your club, I would probably just keep it really simple and have all of your membership types be individual memberships. Uh, again, that won't take away any functionality from your members to set it up that way. It'll just make it a lot easier for you as the club to do that. It'll be less confusing. So memberships, that's note number one. You may or may not need family memberships. Depends on your financial structure. Note number two. If you do have paid memberships, the way you set up the frequency and the start and end dates are critical. So this is the one thing to really nail. So pay attention if you've got paid memberships. I've got two major models that I probably should fall entirely into with my memberships. I, for, or at least each, I should know for this membership type, it is this model or it is this model. Here are the two models. Model number one is a subscription model of membership. So a subscription model of membership is going to be exactly what it sounds like. Think Amazon Prime or Netflix or any other online subscription service these days. I sign up for it, and then it keeps recurring until I cancel it. Pretty simple. So this monthly individual down here would be a great example of a subscription membership type. So note two things here. I've got a frequency down here that tells me how often it's recurring. Pretty straightforward. So if I go to membership price, any of these frequencies would be automatically renewing membership types. Even this custom one down here, I can say like do it every six months if it's going to be semi-annual, for example. Uh, so any of these would be a subscription model of membership. It's automatically going to recur. With subscription model, don't put in an end date. I, there's just not a good use case to put in an end date for a renewing membership type like this. It causes some behavior that's usually not intended here. Um, so the most common way that I would see a subscription model set up is just to not have any start or end date at all. The system is smart enough to know, hey, this is a monthly membership. I'm going to charge them every month. And if they don't renew, then I'm going to expire their membership after a certain number of days. Um, there's some settings in the membership price uh, that we can follow up with you on, like the, you know, how many days pass due to expire the account. But the important, that's all stuff we can tweak. The important thing to know is not to put an end date with a subscription membership. You can put a start date if you're going to pre-sell them. So for example, let's say I'm opening September 1st, but I want to start selling my memberships now. I can do something like have a purchase start date that goes from today to September 1st, let's say. And then my membership start date might be September 1st. This is okay. It's a start date, so they're not gonna activate immediately. I will have to pay for the first month now when I purchase it to save my slot. Uh, but then my next billing date, my, my membership will activate September 1st, and then my next billing date would be October 1st. 
So the billing will line up there. Um, it's just critical that I do not have an end date with this type of membership. That's model number one. Subscription model, it's recurring. It doesn't have an end date. Model number two would be the opposite. It would be a seasonal or pass holder type model. So this is more common for clubs that are open for a season and then close for a season. Port Reserve supports that. There's a seasonal mode. I'm usually going to want to have a one-time price here, not something that's going to try to automatically renew. I want to say you're buying this very specific seasonal membership, and here's the very specific dates that it's active for. So with a seasonal model, I will have a start and end date pretty much every time. The exception would be a lifetime membership. You know, then obviously there is no end date. Uh, but with a seasonal membership, I'll see both. And I should see one time price and only one time price. Those are your two models. And uh, I know sometimes there are uh, extenuating circumstances where there's deals that go on with memberships and court reserve is very flexible to handle that. I would highly recommend talking to me during one of these calls or uh, with any of our online support team whenever making changes to your membership because it is so critical. So I would say payments, memberships, get those set up first because a lot of the other settings in the system will key off of these membership types. So having all of my membership types in there from the start will be very, very helpful. Critical setting number three is how you're getting your players into the system. And there's two ways to do that in mass. Number one that's always available, uh, if you make it available, is going to be the sign-up form. So Court Reserve has a sign-up form that as part of them searching for their club, uh, they can create an account purchase a membership if they want to, and you offer it, all of that sort of thing of creating an account goes through this signup form. So the court reserve signup form, again, is under settings, portal settings, signup form. We always require name and email, uh, but you are free to customize the rest of the form however you want to. So there's an instructions block in here where I can insert images or just text saying, hey, welcome to the club. Here's some things you should know about the rules. I can tweak the fields that are allowed in here. So I can say, hey, I want to require a phone number and date of birth, let's say, as part of the signup form. And then any questions that we didn't catch with just our normal optional fields, you can add yourself. So you could add in a custom field for emergency contact number. Um, you could even do something like have a drop down response that's uh, how did you hear about us? something like that and require that and then give them a couple of different options to say. Uh, very, very common. And then there's a disclosures block down here. Uh, if you've got like a code of conduct policy that you want to put in here, I will say we have a different uh, place in the settings that I'll show you in just a second where you can input an actual waiver for signatures. Um, and so I wouldn't put your general liability waiver in the disclosure block. The disclosure box is a checkbox. Um, it's okay, but it's not as legally airtight as having an actual time-stamped digital signature from someone. And that is something that we offer. So if you go to settings, you'll see waivers and agreements here. Under the reservation settings, there's an article in the knowledge base, this book icon up here, where we walk you through exactly how to set that up. Um, but the overview would just be you can add a liability waiver under waivers and agreements. And then you'll add a signing rule that says who's signing this. So something like this, you might have all members are signing my liability waiver and they're signing it every calendar year. Pretty common. So the sign up form, that's one way to get everyone into the system. Pretty common. The other way would be a member import. So our team has the ability to intake a template that you fill out of members, let's say in an Excel file, and import those members into the system prior to you going live. So if you've already got an existing database of people that you could get into Excel format, uh, the main thing that we would need there would be names and emails, uh, though we can import a lot of additional data as well, like their membership status, uh, payment status, credits, things like that. Um, that's all going to be optional, but possible. Uh, for more information on that, again, I will recommend you to the knowledge base. If you just look up member import, you should see the top hit here is the member list import. 
And as part of this article, you can actually download the Excel template that we recommend, fill out the data in the column, uh, follow along with this pretty short article here, honestly, uh, and then send that into support at courtreserve.com. Typically, it'll take us about a business day to do that import for you. And the first one is free for your club. Uh, and we'll do a couple of tests with that as well, just to make sure everything looks good. So those are your three critical setup pieces. You've got the payment provider choice and setting that up. You've got your memberships and you've got the setup of your signup form and or member import. If you've got those three things done um, or you're just able to check the box and say, hey, we're not doing payments or uh, we got one membership type and it looks good, uh, you're in a great spot with your court reserve setup already. So to put the icing on the cake, you've got the other two layers. You've got the booking types in court reserve, which we'll cover now. And then we'll have a minute or two while where I will show you website. So three booking types in court reserve. I've got lessons, which you'll see all the settings are kind of in this green row here relating to lessons and instructors. I've got reservations, which think of those more as your private court reservations by players. So things like singles and doubles, booking a ball machine on a court, all of those would typically be reservation types. And then I have events. Um, in some court reserve clubs, they will change the name of event to something else like clinic or program, just depending on what the focus of what they're using events for are. Uh, but in the court reserve literature, you'll see this called events. So those are my three booking types. And you'll notice all the settings are grouped by booking type here. And the booking types uh, tend to be very um, isolated from each other with the rules. So what do I mean by that? If I go into booking settings and I say this member is allowed to book courts online because I'm in the reservation part of the settings, that setting only applies to reservations. So I could go in here, I could uncheck this for all people. Now they can't make private court reservations, but the settings for events are set up completely separately. They're their own silo. So they may or may not be able to book events. So that gives you a lot of customization to say, here's what a certain person can or can't do. For example, they you might be a club that has a pretty private membership, but sometimes you do other events and you allow people to sign up for those. This is how you would manage that. You would say, okay, non-member can't make a private court booking, but when I'm setting up some of my events on my calendar later, I might allow them to still create a non-member account and sign up for those events. I'll highlight a couple of the big settings here. Um, typically with lessons and instructors, these are the easiest to set up. Um, Usually you won't touch very many of these settings at all besides just adding your instructors into the system and then setting up some pricing for them. So you can add instructors under the instructors tab. Uh, you'll also be able to get to it just from the top level menu of the system users as well. So when adding an admin or a sub admin, you'll see there's an is instructor box in here. So adding your pros into the system really easy. You just click instructors. You can say create instructor, fill out a couple of uh, questions on their contact, and then they're in the system. Uh, with Court Reserve's new pricing model, you get unlimited courts and unlimited instructors. So you're welcome to add as many as you want in there. There is no limit. The instructor pricing, also pretty straightforward. I'll see the names of my different instructors here, and I'll be able to put in their rates for different lesson types. For booking settings, the most important settings here tend to be how long can I book something? So for example, my pickleball type here, I said can be booked anywhere from one hour to two hours. And then the fee responsibility is really, really critical here. So reservation owner as a fee responsibility means that whatever cost I put in, it's going to charge the booking player for it. And the cost is going to be the court cost. So for example, if I put $20 an hour in as the cost and fee responsibility is reservation owner, that means that the court costs $20 an hour. And if I book it, then I pay the whole thing. Each player based on membership is very different. Each player based on membership says it's not a court cost, it's a cost per player. And I'm gonna look at every person on the booking 
and at each one of their uh, membership types to determine what the cost is going to be. So let's say I've got two members that get courts for free, and then I've got two non-members that have to pay $10 an hour each. Well, if we play doubles together, that would still come out to $20 an hour, uh, but it's going to charge $10 to each of the two non-members. Uh, but if four non-members play with each player based on membership at $10 an hour, now that's going to be $40 an hour, not 20. So reservation owner is by definition a court cost. Each player based on membership by definition is a per player cost. So when I go to settings and I'm under these two rows that deal with reservations and I look at costs, and I go to court cost, I should just have a mental note in my head, hey, if it was reservation owner, this is a court cost. But now if I'm talking about my indoor pickleball courts that were per player, this is per player, not per court. Court reserve isn't splitting this, it's multiplying it if I said each player based on membership. So that's the most common question we get with court costs. So watch that one. As far as the booking rules for reservations, uh, I mentioned how long a reservation can be made um, under the general settings for booking settings. You'll also see a couple of big ones like can a member of this type book online? How far in advance can they book? So non-members might be one versus full members might be seven. For example, are they allowed to edit reservations and what types of edits are they allowed to make? That's another big one. And then one cautionary note to you you will see a couple settings around penalty cancellations. Penalty cancellations in court reserve, think of them like arbitrary strikes I put on an account. So if I late cancel for something, I, I can get a strike on my account. And then maybe if I get to three strikes, I say, um, you know, you're unable to book after you get two strikes, for example. You have to contact us and, you know, we'll give you a slap on the wrist, something like that. That's different then a refund policy. So just think penalty cancellation, completely different than refund policy. Your refund policy is going to be under settings and it's going to be down here in the billing settings. Uh, under auto refund would be where you set up some of your cancellation policy. By default, anything that's paid and then canceled in court reserve goes into a pending refunds bucket here. And so anything that I don't catch goes into the pending refunds and I can see it as an admin and say yes or no on the refund. Uh, and then anytime I want to set up an auto refund rule, it'll override that default tendency. So I can say, okay, if someone cancels a court more than 72 hours in advance, for example, just go ahead and give them the money back to their balance, something like that. Those are the big reservation settings. Uh, and then the last thing is going to be the events in court reserve. So events in court reserve are very one-off types of things uh, in contrast to lessons and reservations where I tend to set up one set of settings and then it kind of covers the whole uh, gamut. So uh, because of this, events can be used for a lot of different things, uh, which might be very different from each other. The place where I know I want and need an event versus one of the other booking types is when I want multiple registrants. Multiple registrants is the thing that tells me this should be an event. So for example, that might be round robins, might be tournaments, could be a summer camp, could be uh, you know a 23 week program, or it could be a Friday night drop-in. Those are all different types of events, but they all have multiple registrants in common. I would recommend when you're setting up your event, You'll have this category drop down that you can type anything into. Try to be pretty specific with this category is best practice. So something like um, afternoon open play. If I try, if I start trying to type that in and it sees I don't have a category, I can just add a new event category right here on the spot. Something like this. And then I can give it a name as well. Usually the name, I will put the time and what it is in there. So I might say like uh, 4 p.m. Thursday open play would be a great name for an event. 
a couple other settings, and then we'll wrap up the events here. Max registrants, obviously how many people can be in or sign up for the event. When is it happening? Uh, recurrence is how often it's happening. So I might do weekly, every week on Thursday for this example. Uh, and then the most important setting for registration is going to be what mode the registration is in. And I've got two options. Single dates is what it sounds like. I'm signing up for this Thursday's open play. So this is a great one for something like an open play. All dates, by contrast, is going to be a sign up for the entire series. So that would be something more like a long form uh, program or academy, something like that would be all dates instead. If I get down here and I see drop in price, I know that's price per date. If I get down here to the pricing and I see full price, I know that's the price for the whole series. Uh, obviously, I can select courts and instructors as well. As soon as I put courts assigned to this event, that's going to automatically block those courts off. As soon as I save the event, I don't have to worry about also going in and creating closures for all of my programming as well. Court Reserve handles all of that as one fluid step. So when you get down here, you can put some pricing in for the event, say who's allowed to sign up for it. When are they allowed to sign up for it? So I might say, hey, registration is going to open two weeks in advance. And it'll close uh, three hours before the first date, let's say, in this case. And then I can save it. So uh, events are very, very powerful. So there are lots of ways to tweak those. Uh, and each one can be different than other events that you have in your system. But that's going to be the overview. One last note on the website, and then we'll take some questions. So the website for Court Reserve, uh, the player portal and the mobile app, um, they're both free. They're included with your Court Reserve subscription. Uh, and what they look like is up to you. Uh, some people really just use the Court Reserve portal and the mobile app uh, on its own, and they do not have any other website, landing page sort of thing. Court Reserve is their one-stop shop. Other people do use a third-party website, which is totally fine. Court Reserve uh, can be built to interface with that as well to a degree. So here's the things to know about that. If I'm using a third-party website, obviously I can just have hot links back and forth where you just copy a URL, put it in a button on the other site, and it links wherever you want it to. But you can also take advantage of these court reserve widgets that are in here. Think of a widget like a window that gets put on a different site that's not court reserve. That's what these are designed for. So something like an event calendar you can set up and then stick it wherever you want on your third party website and it will automatically pull the data from court reserve and display it on your website when you set up this widget it's automatically going to build the code for you that you or whoever's running your third party website can literally copy and paste in um, and you know do some styling with that as well we do have custom css and a link to an article to learn a little bit more about that if you're taking that on yourself so the widgets are a great third-party website tool for the built-in Port Reserve experience. Um, check out the mobile setting. Uh, Modern Dashboard is our most recent version of our mobile app. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it yet because you're still on the old version, I'd highly recommend switching it over and just taking a peek at it. It looks really, really good in my opinion. Uh, and it's a very clean user flow as well. Uh, and then for the website, Portal settings, website, a lot of tabs here you can dive into, but I would start with three. I would start with the general tab and put some social media links in here and just throw some basic colors in here to match your logo. I would upload your logo. And then the third one is going to be your homepage. So your homepage uh, is where it's going to be your landing page for anyone who actually goes to your courtreserve.com domain. A lot of times less is more with this sort of thing. You don't need a ton of different pages layering on top of each other. Most court reserve clubs are going to have a really nice, crisp, uh, wide banner image like what I've got here, and then a couple simple call to action buttons. Um, it is very customizable, but this is going to be kind of stock standard. If you want more information on how to put in a big hero image like this and do some of the preliminary setup, 
I'd highly recommend checking out our knowledge base. And if you just type in website, uh, you're going to get here's some sample information you can plug in, um, the general tab, which I just talked about, uh, and then adding a hero image down here would be another great one to see as well.